I'm originally from, from Omaha, Nebraska, which is not the worst place to drive across <laughs> or walk across or whatever else. Council Bluffs. Council Bluffs is worse, and you have to go through it to get back out here. So, she's in the United States, and by the time I left there um, in late 2010, we were the largest single malt scotch bar in the world. So larger even than any bar in Scotland. I had 904 open single malts and about 450 other whiskeys from around the world, so about 350 American whiskeys. So it's, been, it's really fun. So I've tasted pretty much everything. Um, I think I have just single malts. I have over 4,300 tasting notes. Um, and then rums and tequilas and everything else. Our bar also had 1,100 different kinds of spirits. So we had a bottle of it. We had 200 tequilas. We had 250 vodkas. We carried everything. So I'm really familiar. And so too, if you have questions, not only about the stuff that I'm presenting tonight, but if you have questions about it compared to something else or compared to something that you like, if I've had it, I can probably help you figure out, you know, if you have any questions about any of it, just bring those up and interrupt me at any point in time. Dennis, what's uh, the, the, uh, your green and uh, orange bottle of rum that you always sell? That Diplomatica. Oh, Diplomatica. It's yeah, Diplomatica. Diplomatica. You can make reference to that. Sure. That's, like what, what would be tough. kind of... It is really tough. I actually think the first one you're going to have, I actually think the Botran is, is pretty comparable. Um, the Diplomatico that you, which one is the one that you always see? Reserve. The reserve. reserve. Which their reserve, it is a Solero rum, and if you're not familiar with the Solero process, this is really, um, it's really important to understand with rum and also with sherry. So when I left the Dell at the end of 2010, can you guys hear me all the way down there? Yeah. Okay. My voice carries pretty well. Um, when I left the Dell at the end of 2010, it was to take a position in, um, in Spain, actually with the Sherry Bodega. And so, to me, Sherry production and the use of sherry barrels are very important in all in spirits production. There are tequilas that are aged in sherry barrels, rums, this, this one in particular is aged in sherry barrels, that Diplomatico is aged partially in sherry barrels and pork barrels. So uh, I had the opportunity to come up in Spain and I didn't know anything about sherry. I mean, we can get three sherries, I think, in the state of Nebraska. So my experience with them was very, very limited. But as a sommelier, the, the appeal to get back into the wine world was really interesting to me. And then I sold sherry barrels to the whiskey industry. So I kind of kept one foot in both industries. So I moved back um, exactly a year ago to take this position with Stoller in Chicago. And it's been just a blast. I get the question a lot, like, why wouldn't you work for a rum company or like a scotch company or a larger distributor? But to be completely honest with you, Stoller, we're the third largest distributor in Illinois. And it's a family owned company. It's three brothers and their father that run the company. And they kind of let me do whatever I want. And it's been really, really nice. Like a huge company would not be sending me on these trips or letting me, I mean, if we were talking about, like Jason just brought up this tequila that you had in Mexico. If it's not already available in Illinois, I can go out, I can find it, I can develop pricing on it and put it in the market without ever talking to my boss. And I don't think many people get the opportunity to do that. So it's pretty cool. Um, these rums, the very first one we're going to have <clears throat> is Botran. It's Guatemalan rum. And if you're familiar with Guatemalan rum, the one that most people are familiar with is Ron Zacapa, which is a 23-year-old Solera processed rum. And for a lot of people, it's like their favorite rum. I mean, a lot of people think it's the best rum they've ever had. There's only one distillery in Guatemala, so we can't say on the bottle that this is made there, but if you read the back of a Zacapa bottle and the back of a Botran bottle, these are the same rum. This is just a younger version. So they actually make, um, it's actually the Zacapa family, or I'm sorry, it's the Botran family that distills rum Zacapa. They just sold the brand to a bigger company, so they can't call it that anymore. So they had a five-year non-compete once the brand sold, and as of late last year, we were able to start putting these Botran um, rums in the market. So the one that we're trying tonight is the little bit higher end one. They have one called Reserva that is a five, to eight year old, or I'm sorry, it's a five to 11 year old Solera process rum. This one's five to 18. So you constantly have this flux of things going through barrels. And that's what the Solera process really means is that every time you take something out, so every time they take out 18 year old rum to put it in bottle, they put 14 year old, you know, stuff that's aged five to 14 years old in to fill that barrel and then leave it in for a further four years. So this one spent its first five years in bourbon barrels, then it spent from five to 11 in sherry barrels. Then this one goes on and spends 11 to 18 in port barrels. And that's basically what Ron Zacapa does, except they leave it in for another five years. And actually, I think they put it back in bourbon barrels to kind of brighten it up a little bit. So this is kind of the step before that. It's a lot less expensive than Ron Zacapa, but it's kind of like Ron Zacapa's younger brother. And to me, to be honest with you, I love Ron Zacapa, the 23, but it, it does get a little woody. It's been in wood for a really long time in these huge barrels. So this one, to me, I actually like it better. The price point is better. It's brighter. Um, I don't know if you've tasted it yet. It's fantastic. And if you know Zacapa, you will definitely get all of those really, really familiar Have you poured it yet? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what this is here. That's the one that you've got in front of you. This is 5 to 18 years old. 
So the youngest. So that's a really kind of a misnomer. When you see something like Ron Sakapa 23, or you see this, people think it's 23 year old rum. It's not. It's five to 23 year old rum. There is a bunch of five year old rum in there too. That's. It's just a specific kind of. Um, I don't know mix that they do almost. What is your name? Monique. Monique. What does the aging process do? Does it take the taste out of the wood? What does it do? It does. The aging process is a really good question. And um, I, I, I will probably, it will make more sense because I study whiskey a lot more thoroughly than everything else. What actually happens when you char the inside of a barrel, and you can char it from like a one to five char. So if you're, if you're charring it to five, you're basically burning the inside of the barrel. If you're doing it to a one, it's just a toast. You are actually bringing all kinds of chemicals to the surface of the barrel. And so they say there are just under 100 different chemical components that are bought, brought to the surface. Over half of them are vanillins. Um, another quarter of them are all citrus. Vanilla, vanilla is like vanilla. Like vanilla. Actually, most of the vanilla extract, the natural vanilla extract that we use, actually comes from wood. It doesn't come from vanilla beans. Unless the bottle says it's a vanilla bean, a Madagascar vanilla, you're probably actually well, using something in cooking that has almost been scraped from the inside of a barrel. So when you char the inside, you see oils come to the surface of it. I mean, there's all kinds, you know, there's not really water left anymore. They leave the staves out to dry. But when they go through and char it, you see all these kind of oils come to the surface. If you kind of scrape away all those oils, that's vanilla extract, essentially. Yeah, once it's cleaned up. And it's got alcohol in it. <clears throat> they add alcohol, a little bit of alcohol to it as well. Yeah? How do they char the barrels? They don't, they, well, they won't have either end on the barrel yet, but while it's still at the cooperage, um, they'll take, you know, so kind of like that hollow barrel, and it goes down kind of a conveyor belt line that just has big flames coming out of it. And so if it's, you're, it's actually cool. in a barrel. <coughs> it's actually already in the barrel form. Yeah. They have the flames yep. up inside. Exactly. And so if it's a one char, it's you know, it's like a second. If it's a five char, it's like 20 seconds with just full flames on the inside of it. So there are different bourbon companies that like really heavy char. There are different, you know, some that just want toasted. The more kind of char notes, kind of burnt caramel notes, flan notes, things like that that you want in a bourbon, you're going to use a heavy char. If you want that really light, kind of citrusy, more honey, you're going to use a really light char. So it's all about what you want, what your specifications are. But all of the barrels that we're using, these companies, the rum companies, don't really get to specify that char. But they do get to take where they're buying their bourbon, sherry, and pork barrels from. So that's the way that they're going to go through and pick that. So all the color that we're getting in this comes from the barrels. So you're not going to see really like a bourbony color. You do tend to get kind of almost wine notes. You tend to get more in amber and you'll get some reds in rums because you're also using port and sherry barrels. So you'll get all those notes. And when you taste bourbon, you don't normally associate bourbon with being very tannic, but there's no wine involved in aging a bourbon. You're not using wine barrels, you're just using brandy barrels. Do they, do they do the same process with wine or is wine just left in barrels? Wine, when it's in barrels, they typically would use a very light char because there's no reason to have those really big caramely. There's no reason for that. You might want some vanilla, you might want some honey, but you're not going to want anything kind of char. And you don't want the wine unless it's a red. You don't want the wine to take on a lot of color added to it and then it's not been chill filtered. And those are really, really... Rum also? What's that? Rum also. Rum also. Yep. Rum yep. Rum yep. Well, rum can have color added scotch. Legally cannot. Bourbon legally cannot. Once it's above 46%, it's just, they just don't do it. What is chill filtering? Chill filtering is really important. And, and most of these rums are going to be chill filtered, but a lot of scotches aren't. Chill filtration is a process. Um, I actually, I enjoy it. That's been a nice thing about just being in the Illinois market. When, even when I was in Nebraska or when I've done national kind of spirit stuff, um, if I go out to California and I try and explain this point, it doesn't make any sense. But if you think about a good ribeye steak that has fat marbled all the way throughout it, if you stripped out all the fat through a filtration process, you would have an awful piece of meat. It would change yeah. the mouthfeel. It would change everything. It would change the flavor. I mean, all kinds of things. So when you chill filter anything, you bring it down to freezing, you run it through a series of, of filters, metal filters, and then all the way through paper filters to, to pull out fats, you pull out lipids and solution. The reason for that is that if we put um, a really high proof scotch, with, if we put cold water in it, or if it gets cold, like even, they're not doing it anymore. When I first brought this bottle in, it is kind of cloudy. Um, it gets cloudy because the lipids, the fats in solution freeze. And so that's all it is. But 15 years ago when people were drinking single malts, typically people would drink them on the rocks. The second you put a cube of ice in it, it clouds up. And your brain says, okay, I just watched that go from perfectly clear, beautiful scotch to this weird, cloudy, murky material. So people would return them. So they'd return them to Dennis. Dennis would return them to me. I sent them all the way back to Scotland. So about 15 years ago, 1983 to 1988, they started chill filtering everything. So if you find scotches that were bottled in the 80s, they're always going to be 
lower proof, chill filtered, I mean they're completely different animals. But the market has gotten so much more sophisticated. Right now about 92% of the total scotch market is, um, is blends. 8% is single malts, but that's been up about a percentage a year, about a percentage every two years or 10 years. So it's a more sophisticated consumer that wants higher proof, that wants non-chill filter, that kind of wants the whiskey or rum or whatever it is in its raw form. So if we want to put water in it, that's fine. If you want to add water to some of these to make them smoother, that's great, but they're not doing it for you, which is fantastic. So chill filtration is really important. So when I, as a scotch drinker or as a buyer, I don't buy, I try not to buy things that are bottled at lower than 46% that's it's just a quality thing with me. Um, I do. I did bring a couple scotches too that we can taste later, but wasn't part of the plan. But things kind of get out of hand here. You're crazy. I am crazy. I, 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 I have attended five scotch tastings with Sigma Law Society in America, and they put a day aside for all the stills. And what I notice is that when they're sitting there getting ready to drink their scotch, they have an eyedropper, and they just put a couple of drops of water in their scotch. And that's all. Yeah. Is, is, is that just a... Well, it's over, we're talking about um, adding water to scotch. Or really, to be totally honest with you, if you have to add ice to something to drink it, you don't like the taste of it. Because when you add ice to something and you chill it, it's because you don't like the flavors in it. We drink Bud Light at 33 degrees because at room temperature, if you've ever accidentally had one, I like Bud Light, but at room temperature, it tastes horrible. Absolutely horrible. Because the ingredients that go into it are not the highest quality beer ingredients. But you can drink Guinness or you can drink a good stout at almost room temperature because it's great. Um, so when you chill something, it's because you don't like the taste of it. But if you add water to something, so if, you, if you're dealing with a scotch that's 50% alcohol, you got 50% alcohol, which is lighter than water, sitting on top, 50% alcohol sitting on the bottom. Swirling it isn't going to oxidize it. You're just swishing it around. You're not really doing anything. But when you add a drop of water or two drops of water, you're breaking the surface tension of the alcohol. The water that you dropped in wants to join the water at the bottom of the glass, so you actually oxidize, like you actually aerate it. So that's really the purpose of doing that. So I, though, would always, always try anything completely neat first. If you know that it's very high alcohol, don't get your nose super far into the glass. Don't take a huge gulp of it. But take a little sip of it so that you can judge for yourself, does this need two drops of water or does this need an ounce of water? I mean, maybe it needs a lot. Could you just run it through a spirit aerator instead if you want to aerate it? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you wanted to, sure. And like even those, um, yeah, it's pretty much, yeah. Yeah, you could run it through like a wine aerator or a spirit aerator or something like that, yeah, if you wanted to. Um, know though too, once you really aerate something, especially um, anything aged in wine barrels, it can actually make it taste worse. Um, what you'll pull out of especially old sherry barrels are sulfur notes and cardboard notes. And with some scotches, those are good. They'll kind of blend into everything, but I've also had, I've had 60 year old scotch that if you even add a drop of water to it, if you even get it, you know, aerate it at all, they completely change, they taste horrible. It's just wow. one of those things. Uh, so do you 